Okay, so I'm about to get this started. Probably be inviting more people to probably be coming in as we continue to move forward. So hi everyone out there in the virtual world. I'm Boyd Smith. Um originally from North Carolina, spent time in Indiana and now living in Colorado. Um and here is a quick little summary of the rudiments of Supre, solo exhibition uh, by myself. Um for a thesis exhibition I did at Purdue University. Um, the thing about to start off with with Supre, um, how I came about it was I was looking to create some type of superhero action figure that was based off uh, black life experiences. Um, and a friend of mine who, who was actually grad student at Purdue at the time was saying like, hey, you should really think of the super predator and how that story fits along with what you're saying and how you can build all content about that. So I had, I was familiar with super predator before really super a, but really didn't think about putting the concept together the way I did and the way that the patterns of um, injustice seem to relate to each other and seem to also repeat itself through the history of Black America uh, perspective, Nisei. So here we go, we get this started going here soon. Um, if already, everybody can see the screen, can I get a thumbs up? Okay, can we see? Okay, cool. So make sure we're we good. So interest to pray, um, the term super predator um, describe uh, young Black boys played a crucial role in mass incarceration. Um, and a lot of people believe it was the prison, the pipeline from high school to the prison, the pipeline, excuse me. And that it popularized negative stereotypes of black youth. Um, because of that, what I did was in this first piece, the six foot by three introduction to Supre, I took the actual video from the New York Times and uploaded into these um, display screens and the thing about it was I wanted this piece to basically tell the like the story of how Super Predator basically started and, and how they documented it and how it became really popular basically through the media. Um, with that, I took the uh, visual story of it and uploaded it into the display screen. And from there, I manipulated the image to make it look like uh, off the air bars used to say, and the concept from that comes from how a lot of things was being told that um, injustice basically was in neighborhoods, but nobody really had proof until really social media came about. And from there, it developed its own platform. And so with this, I wanted to show like how the media or this video particularly does the same thing, just on a documentary perspective. Um, Moving forward, here's a video of um, the rudiments of Super Predator, well, not but the documentary of Super Predator on the screen itself. Um, on the left side of the head, I took clips of words, newspapers um, that were keywords people used on social media during those times of talking about Trayvon Martin, um, Michael Brown, um, Sandra Blanche, of that nature, Kaepernick. So I was I took news newspaper clippings and uh, glued them all to the side as if it was in a bubble, uh, a head bubble, and and it's just all those little words that really kicks off certain um, anger or sadness, um, anxieties, um, distress, um, and basically put them all into uh, one concept here, as you see an example here. So moving forward with this is my son next. Um, this piece I took from using um, a lot of mothers uh, who um, lost their child due to injustice. And from there, I named this piece as my son, Nix. Um, and this goes on with Tamir Rice and Jordan Davis, uh, two black boys murdered unjustly. Um, so with that, a lot of mothers, um, I was noticing a pattern of how they would always repeat the thing they were saying and didn't even know each other, which was, um, is my son next? Or how do I know if my son goes to school 
Um, he won't come back in a body bag or if my son goes out and play or if my son goes to work and all these different examples uh, people were using. And so I chose to use Timmy Rice and Jordan Davis to describe this piece. And with that inside the eyes are um, LCD screens. And with the Tamir, um, I had the date in which the incident took place and probably the hashtag of social media contest that was used in the other eyes there. Same thing for uh, Jordan Davis, uh, basically had the time uh, or the location where it happened at and the date of his death, which is in his eye. And the other one is just basically kind of like off uh, the air. So all in all with this, the rudiment basically means putting things together to form something else or something that's on the come up to becoming something. And with this, I kind of seen it as all this content coming together and, and, and it formed people basically taking up protesting and, and taking actions in the community and letting their voices be heard. And here's a video of that. The Supre video on the, the main focus there was a video of a protest. Um, I believe that one was Tamir Rice. Um, same thing as it goes to the, the original first piece, the introduction to Supre of how I was taking videos and chopping them up, but every single video is different. And I believe this one was the community of uh, Tamir Rice and Jordan Davis who had basically did protests in the area. So I took that video footage, uploaded it and put it in the eyes of theirs. So therefore you kind of have a, a, a video visual and also like a stagnant with, with the still images of people in the background holding up signs and, and going from there. Um, another thing about this piece as well is, is the texture, how it looks so distressed. And I kind of wanted to use that texture as a way of uh, showing some type of emotions. Um, it's really why you don't never really get a clear picture. It's kind of like always in the making, of, if not look confused or half destroyed or either half built, but just not fully all the way there. And here's another uh, video of Tamir here. And then this one on the left screen says transparency uh, malfunction and it's counting up uh, 200. And on the right side, it has the rudiments of Supre. So. so H2O is a form of classism. Um, this one particularly speaks to um, Flint, Michigan. Um, I went with a couple other grad students who were in agriculture. We went up to Flint um, while we were at Purdue and talked to a couple of people in the community. Um, and actually got a feel for like what was really going on there. Um, and I'm trying to retract of, of us being inside of a, a Sam's um, warehouse getting, oh man, we ordered, oh my God. 2,000 bottles of water, maybe. Uh, I, I think it was 20, it was either two or 20,000. I'm gonna go with 20,000 because our truck was so heavy, it was rocking back and forth. Um, but with that, I was wanting to get a behind the scenes of behind the feel of how people were doing in Flint. Um, I never seen been somewhere where we go to so many stores and they were out of water. Um, almost like, it kind of reminded me of, uh, I'm from the East Coast, so hurricanes, huge where I'm from. So it kind of reminded me of those moments in those times in, in my childhood. Um, but so, you know, we was in Flint, so they don't get hurricanes in Flint. But with that, um, looking at the neighborhoods and going through the communities of these, the people who didn't have access to water, um, was real touching because there really was nothing there. I mean, they didn't even have a McDonald's in the area where it was. It was just a lot of abandoned buildings, houses, and just vacant lots. And people literally stayed there. Um, but with that, I was thinking of how classism and location in area codes and zip codes um, is a form of classism. And, and that's how I came up with the concept of water being a form of classism. And the image is basically a few of us that were there looking at a couple of other people in the community and talking to them from there. Um, the video footage of this piece is actually us um, donating water to the community coming through there and just passing it out. Um, literally was there for almost 12 hours a day, if not more, 
and we did it twice. So it was a eye open experience and I had a lot of documentary on that as well too. Um, they protesting again, um, this piece here, um, basically touches on people who, who are used to just, um, seeing injustice done in the community and basically still letting their voices be heard. But then you have people who don't know what's really going on in the community. They always like, you know, why are they protesting? Are they protesting again? And for what? Um, so this is kind of what this piece relates to, um, the eye opener of this was how things over time seem to, to repeat itself. And I've noticed through a lot of uh, news clippings of certain words that was used, or if I get a couple of older news clipping, how um, the times or, or like the technology was different, but the concept was still modern in a form of way, like it was still um, being used just in, in a more modern way um, of how things weren't really being met or basically being talked about like they should have been. And from there, it, it becomes a form of like exhaustion uh, because of all the experience in particular communities. And a lot of people always feel like they're, they're never heard or their justice is never heard. Here we have a quick video of what I use here, just for justice we fight, community we unite. Um, same thing on the other one here, news clippings in the mouth there of how I was reading all this and um, was noticing how these, these news clippings were forming stories like uh, neighborhood black history on cops. Um, that perspective goes a long way from beginning of time versus the, the present. And from there, I just took that type of footage and basically turned into this piece here. Um, but yeah. Um, I never met them, but they remind me of my family. Um, it's a true story. Um, I come from a, a family of a lot of females, a lot of aunts and, and female cousins. Um, so when, you know, I look at um, Corinne Gaines, Ayanna Jones and Sandra Bland, it kind of reminds me of my own family. So it's where the title comes from from that. Um, the video footage is actually of Ayanna Jones's grandmother who was in the house when she was killed on the land, sleeping on the couch and how she was giving her testimony of that. Um, Sandra Bland, I didn't really put too many words in her. Um, I just basically just highlighted the eyes of hers. Um, Corinne Gaines um, basically had her name up there and, and uh, the date in which she passed. Um, Flaps line before 21, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin. Uh, in the main screen there, there's basically people just having a debate, open community debate about how they feel and things that were going on. Uh, Michael Brown has his name in it and uh, his date of birth, I'm mistaken, and same as Trayvon Martin, um, the day he passed and it had, um, I fear for my life, which was a, a big hot topic on when, um, George Zimmerman was up for trial for his murder. And here's an up close view of that and a video image of that. A lot of these LCDs um, words again came from social media. Um, I think social media has been a big advocate on eye opening these past I don't know, 10, 20 years almost um, since technology has really been a forefront of people protesting. And um, lastly, um, is what's in the future. Um, and this basically just kind of gives the character super uh, power back as being a leader in his community. And with this one, um, I remember this one being the last of the series, which I liked. Um, it kind of means like it was the, the rudiments of all these um, ideas, concepts, really pulling itself together and like something's going to unfold. And from there, I kind of wanted this scene to be like um, looking out in the future, like things were going to change, things were going to come to their perspective. Um, I also did this right before Donald Trump actually got into office. Um, so it was pretty interesting to read some of these news clipper clips, which I had when they were speaking about the future, which I tagged in there, which 
And it's probably why you see like a lot of, uh, you see a lot of Trump wordage in there too. Cause again, he was running for president then before he even won. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of these little things in there. Talk about black Latinos and their concepts and communities and how they live and how they uh, face injustice, so injustice perspectives and um, just overall communities and how they're gonna build and what they was gonna look like moving forward. Um, with everything, but that is the last of the series here. Um, my contact information is there, I need to, but at this time, I want to start answering questions. I got a feeling that a lot of my people want to answer more questions than anything. So um, just let me know. We can start off whoever wants to answer questions first and just don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just going to like jump in and cut somebody off, but, um, so I have a question about the, um, for, I mean, first of all, it's a, a fantastic exhibit. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I was wondering if, or how the, the roles of color or, or how you went about incorporating color, because I noticed there was a lot of color. And so I was wondering if there was any particular meaning behind it, any, um, you know, particular rhyme or reason for uh, the colors that you chose and the uh, interactions of color, as we okay. saw. Good question. Um, the rose of color, um, one was based off, you know, how you have the TV off the air and the bars come off. So that was one perspective. Number two, the um, anxiety, um, all the emotions couldn't just stick to one color. So you have warm and cold colors would disguise, you know, a warm or cold feeling um, and confusion. Um, that's the reason why I chose to use a lot of colors too. And as well as um, in all my artwork, a lot of color seems to attract a lot of people. So uh, using variety of colors seems to get a person's attention and it draws them in near to come closer, which puts them on the content. Um, if I was to chose to do this in the black and white, I probably wouldn't get a strong response because of the lack of color. Um, but that might be something I might be trying to do in the future. Um, just having different shades of grays, whites, and blacks. Um, I think that might be something I'll move towards too, but just see the response I get from the viewers. But overall really was to grab the attention of people um, with the colors and, and all this looks beautiful far away. But when you get up on it, I mean, it has a serious story to tell and why all those colors together. And, and it feels like all those colors are telling their own individual story and it collabs together. It's almost like a collage of colors of that situation, what's going on. So um, that's a few of the reasons of why I, I put a lot of color in there and why it seems to stick with it from over the time to that way. Um, any other questions? Okay, I don't have a question, um, but Boyd, I had you as a teacher for my drawing class three years ago at Purdue. I'm in my senior year doing my student teaching at Jefferson High School here in Lafayette. Nice. Um, and I've remembered you every year. I always think about you, which is probably weird, but you've had such an impact, even just me as an artist. I remember one of your last notes to me on like a portfolio review was just, it was just so simple. It just said, keep drawing, keep making art. Um, and even that was just profound to just be inspired by you. Um, so now in my student teaching semester, I have this awesome painting class of super diverse students, super talented. And I saw your name pop up, um, that you had an exhibition going on. I was like, no way. This is so cool. And so I checked it out. I was like, this is awesome. And if you know anything of the students in the Lafayette School Corporation background is that they have very low income families, very diverse, come from just hard life situations. And so that's what they bring to the classroom with them. Um, and so this, I, I actually use this exhibition and you as an artist as inspiration for a project that they've been working on um, as art, as activism and really trying to find their own voice um, within their art. 
And so we went through your entire virtual gallery online and just, they got to talk about it and it really opened up a platform for an open dialogue of just sharing just um, either racism or prejudice that they've experienced in their own lives because they have, this is, this is their normal. And so I really just try to focus on like, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. This is um, kind of the juxtaposition, juxtaposition is how um, a certain race or ethnicity is often portrayed in, in culture or social media and just had awesome discussion and students who don't usually talk in class, this allowed them to feel like they had a voice and to talk up. And so they were just even within the first couple moments of looking through some of your paintings in this and mixed media, like it truly did inspire them and it got them excited to realize like, oh, like they, they as artists can make an impact because oftentimes I feel like students kind of see that artists are like so disconnected from them that it's like, oh, they're out from like centuries ago and they can never be like them or famous artist in New York City. And it's like, no, this is an artist who created work here either in Lafayette or that it's somehow connected to your community. Um, and so it just kind of like, I saw like the wheels turning in their head of like, oh my gosh, like this person like, matters in that like they've given me a voice especially as like the young black students I have in class and like I just saw their eyes light up and so I just want to say thank you for being the awesome artist and in person that you are and just kind of show you that you've impacted me and therefore now impacting students probably for as long as I'm going to be teaching so thank you so much. Dana it's been a pleasure <laughs> uh, serving you as, as as a mentor on why you was at Purdue and at the same time like um Thank you again. Um, just showcasing the work, but um, I'm, I'm humble, deeply humble, I should say. But I really do appreciate it, and I'm glad like I can make an impact on students. Um, a lot of people don't know like I'm always focusing on future generations because I always like to inspire new stuff and in, in with them. And this is reason why I chose to do the work the way it is, why I chose to do technology inside of it, um, just to bring attention a little bit to the younger generation um, and and to show them that you can't really just um, put yourself on a certain platform, like it's really good to be uh, broad, ex you know, experiment, you know, experiment a little bit of what you want to do to make your voice be heard. And um, um, anytime you, I tell you what, anytime you want to talk to me, to talk to your class, I'll be more than willing to do that. I'm always for speaking to future generations because um, I know how I was when I was growing up and, and with being uh, connected or having this connection with future generations, like I get it, like I've been there, like I'm older than you all, I'm way older than you all, so like I understand what you're going through. It's just that things change. So just cause the modern times have changed, people think it's not the same, but it really is still have the same story. And I think people don't realize that because it's so different. But again, Dana, thank you. I, I, I really, I'm glad you're still doing it. And I, I'm really proud of you for what you're doing right now. And I appreciate you even taking time to even just saying what you're saying. So thank you. Yes, thank you. I'll definitely be in contact with you then. <laughs> sure. Hey, Boyd, this is Lori from the Art Museum, and we have a I question on Facebook. Um, okay. Have you thought about adding to the exhibit or doing a part two? Yes, I have. Um, the so so super aid like this this rudiment like the the series itself is like the start. It was like me basically coming out with different ideas and putting them on each one. Um, and from there, I was wanting to start up a comic book for each one of those. Um, and from there, start using AR, augmented reality on comic books. So with the videos, even though you get a still image with that, um, what is something that a cure up, even on a QR code, something that a, be a visual guide, people can use smart devices on and things of that nature. So yes, I'm already in the process of making it um, whenever I'm not working my crazy nine to five. Um, I try to uh, relax a little bit and see what I come up with, but I am in the plans of doing a, a series two, um, and it will involve uh, people using their smartphones to get more information um, to that perspective. So yes, I am. We have any other questions? I have a question actually. Um, How are you? So I'm great boy. Thank you so much for your work. Um, your, your work actually inspired me when I first came to the Black Cultural Center and that's when I had my first encounter to you, your work and just all the vibrancy and I'm so thankful that I have it on my wall now. Okay. It means 
so much to me. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was about, you know, your own emotional and mental health process in creating this, because so many times it can be draining to encounter all of these stories and then to have to, you know, find a way to create it and make it art. So what was that process like for you? Well, I'm trying to think where to start. Um, overall, the process of it was draining, um, especially looking up the content and like viewing it from word from word. If I wasn't reading about it in a newspaper, I was seeing it on social media. If I wasn't seeing it on social media, I was seeing it on videos. So with that, um, it became very exhausting, um, sad, for sure, depressing, for sure. Um, it's the reason why I'm not on social media as much today. So with that, all that mental anguish, uh, maybe take a, a very big step back and how social media uh, became a great platform for people to voice their opinions and show these things that wasn't getting highlighted on and bringing attention to people who weren't basically being overlooked in communities. But all in all, when you get the same content that's on the same level that keeps repeating itself all and over and over again, yeah, it takes a lot out of you. Um, so uh, with that being said, um, very draining. Um, but I knew the work kind of had to be done. The one thing that scared me the most was looking at the names of people who were killed unjustly. And I wanted to tackle that before I actually really looked at the list. And I was like, this is at least, if, 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 if everything was to stop, all these unjust killings was to stop like today, it'd take me probably at least 10 years, I think, if not more to really get just all that work together. Um, and that was just looking at all the names that someone had put together. Um, and I had thought about doing a project myself though, but the content is so overwhelming. I just didn't know where to start. Um, but with that being said, you know, taking a mind break is always good for yourself, staying mental, uh, mentally strong, mental health, all that's viable. Um, but at the same time, I, it's almost kind of like an actor, you know, how to get in, so involved in character, you know, that the point that they had to take a break and, and find themselves again or whatnot and get out of character. It's kind of how I feel as I've been like an artist, as far as like digging in this content, you know, looking at this, does connect to this, oh, look, this happened, all these connections and these patterns that I'm noticing. Um, I got really involved in it and to the point where after I was done with the series, I probably got off social media for a strong six months, maybe close to a year just because if, if anything, I changed the content on the social media and didn't want to look at that. And, and the same thing that's been passed this past year with George Floyd, like um, somebody asked me I was gonna do something on that. Like, I was like, I mean, yeah, but no necessarily say at least, but it's like, I kind of already covered that. It's just another person, you know? And then now I'm kind of feeling like, well, am I getting numb to the pain, which is not good neither. You know, so it's just all these little questions I'm asking myself. And, and still trying to figure out how to fight that battle, to be honest with you. So taking it day by day, to be honest with you. So Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have any other questions? Boyd, we have another question in the yes. chat. Um, yes. Can you tell us what you are doing in your work life now? In my work life now, I'm... <laughs> I'm currently a curator of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Museum um, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, I, for, first and foremost, I love the job. Let me start there. But um, as it's demanding, um, and I like that. And I'm studying content from 1904 to the present um, for all the games, uh, whether it's an athlete, whether uh, Paralympians, looking at how to balance that visual and that content within the museum, as well as with the Olympics. So I'm in the process of learning a lot of new history that I didn't know about beforehand, which is good. Um, I've been doing this for about roughly eight months now, um, and I like it. I really do like it a lot. So with this being said, I met a lot of people. Um, we actually had Tony, Tony Dungy come through here yesterday. Um, so it's just every day is different. It's never the same, um, but I enjoy it a lot and look forward to helping um, build content on all the, the diversities that America has to has when it comes to the, the land of sports. Like it's, oh man, 
it's amazing. And I think a lot of people really don't realize how much like rich the American really has of history of diverse cultures and how we always come together in a unit when it's time to win, you know? So, and, that, and that's, that's the uniqueness I like about it a lot though. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm doing my nine to five right now. Um, again, I like it a lot, um, a lot of content to study, um, especially on the technology side as well as artifact side. So I'm doing a lot of things with that, building content for new exhibitions coming up in the future, um, studying old content. Um, like I found out one of the first Paralympians um, in the games really was in 1904 in St. Louis when they had the first Olympic games there and he ran, I think he won six medals. You know, that's before they even gave the title of a Paralympian to a Paralympian when he was running with Olympians. So little things like that. I like finding out little history facts like that. And um, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm doing right now. Boyd, this is Vera Johnson and Al Johnson. We are just so happy to see your face. We love you still. Thank you. And are so proud of you. And we just wanted to let you know that we still support you. And Thank that's you. why we're sitting here quietly listening to you. It's so proud. Hearts full. Just love to see your face and so happy to see you. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, has did, did the COVID era uh, impact your creativity in any way or are you still just sailing right along uh, in the creative vein? I know you're busy, but uh, did it impact you at all uh, as far as your creative vein? Um, yes, a little bit of both. So the one thing about COVID I was paying attention to most was how it flourished out new creativities because everybody's living a new norm. So I kind of want to see what creative path was coming out of the public. And with that became like live parties online. Like I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Like whoever thought of doing a live DJ, you know, on, on a computer, but you got like a million people who's all connected in the same room. Clever thing ever. So, so little stuff like that, I was basically doing like more just studying, seeing what things are new, how technology um, today has benefited people in, the, in the, this pandemic, I should say. Like a lot of people more connected doing technology uh, a lot of people who didn't even know how to use technology are now doing technology. So it's kind of putting everybody in these like private but virtual bubbles. And so I've been looking at seeing like what things like even crime rates gonna go up, like little things like that, just paying attention like how everybody's lives change and what was drastic and stayed the same throughout the whole process of that. And with that, I've been listening to a lot of music, a lot of a lot of music, and seeing like how a lot of musicians are coming on that perspective as well too, of how they're looking at um, this pandemic and how it's changing their art form. Um, but as far as me with creativity, um, more time to flush out ideas I had, I should say. Um, again, like with the the part series two of, of Supre, trying to flourish that out a little bit more, and how people are using technology to. Eat to that extent. Um, but all in all, I should say that music has inclined my um, ideals, I should say, just because through COVID and listening how to put music with uh, emotions. Um, so that's been something I've been trying to figure out how to put that visually. Um, so I'm still trying to figure that out yet. But that's one of the quickest things I can name right now that's come out of me trying to create throughout COVID. And sometimes it might come to the end of this year, you know, sometimes I might just process what I'm feeling and experience of what was before COVID versus what's now COVID and where do they align together and what can I put out from there? Um, but all in all, yeah, definitely been brewing up a storm on creativity through COVID because people really have more time to sit back and relax and actually take in things that they miss or either took for granted because we're, we're in these bubbles right now, uh, temporary bubbles, I should say for right now, stuff like that. But um, love you two both. Glad you all saw it. Hey, Al, see you. All right, no. <laughs> May I ask one more question or is that against yeah. the rules? No, you're fine. Well, I just want to know, I, when I, when I uh, viewed your work, I. I see your work uh, partnered with the movie that, that addresses social issues like that. Have you thought of that? I, I could see it. A movie? Anything merging with movie, with partnering with movie 
Yeah. Honestly, I would not mind doing that. To be honest with you, I probably would take a. a oh, yes, I wouldn't mind doing that. I would love to do that. To be honest, with you. <laughs> cut it quick and short. Um, that is something I really would not mind doing. If not directing, if not assistant directing a movie or whatnot. Um, I don't know what it is, but something like I kind of have a niche for a little bit, and and creating this story of how the the beginning, the middle, and the end, and the details of what's going on. No, like, um, just basically molding all that together and, and figure out where I can go from there. I don't know, who knows that that might be a new form of medium art. I might start doing this movies. It's very powerful. That's Note all it. I have to say, very right. powerful. Note it, thank you. Lori, did hey, I miss Boyd. Hey question? Boyd, Boyd, this is Kendall. Hey, how are you? How are you doing? Good, how are you? Oh, nice presentation. You know, uh, I remember a number of years ago when you walked into the art museum in Lafayette and came, walked up into my office and said, hey, tell me about this place. Uh, how can I get involved here? And that was really a start of your kind of getting involved in our community. Right. And uh, um, I said, and you told me all about your work and then showed me pictures of your gallery back in uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah, and uh, I said, can you teach here? <laughs> they said, well, I'll think about it. So then you taught classes and inspired a lot of people at the art museum and your painting classes. And, um, and then we kind of followed each other in friendship through those years you were here. And, and you, Renee got, got involved and got you as her curator at the, at the BCC. Uh, and then when I came to your master's thesis show over at Powell Hall, and you had the rudiments of Supri, <laughs> I told you that night, I said, wait, what are you gonna do with this after, after today's show? And you said, I don't know. I said, well, we'd, it, it belongs in a larger space and a better museum and, and uh, get to expose more of the community. And this is a perfect year for what we've done. Right. Even though we're, you know, had to, we have to be kind of restricted with our audience sizes. We've had a lot of visitors, a lot of people love, love your work and it's so appropriate to what's going on in the world of racial injustice and right. And, and bringing justice to everybody today. So um, I've appreciated your friendship for a long time. And also I've, you, you've uh, brought a lot to our community. Right, I'm glad I did. And Kendall, thank you for the opportunity, you know, even taking a chance on me. Cause I do remember coming in there asking what this museum is all about on day one. I do remember that. I know. <laughs> I know man, it caught my attention. <laughs> But I, I appreciate it. I really do um, bringing me into to the gallery there. And I'm glad my work um, has inspired a lot of people as well, too. Um, it means a lot, to be honest with you, because uh, I just remember putting all in that work. Um, probably, I don't know, I remember not sleeping that week when the show was due. So um, I think I stayed up for almost three days. And I remember sleeping on that Friday uh, when the show was in there, though. So, uh, yeah. So you. You know, your major professor was Charles Gick, wasn't he? Yes, yes. and that's that. Did you see painting. that painting over my shoulder here in our exactly. in our living room? When you when you said who you were, I said, "Oh, that's Gick's painting back there." I know that. I know that style anywhere. Yeah, right? That's Charles. Yeah, it's one of my favorite pieces he did, actually. So yeah, yeah. that's the road ahead. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, may, may I ask another question? Sure. Um, so uh, I'm kind of, I would really appreciate to get one of like your, some of your perspective on um, an issue that's happening like right now in social media, because you mentioned how social media um, can act as like sort of a vehicle for activism today. Right. And right now, and especially after, um, you know, what happened with George Floyd and the riots that ensued afterwards and everything since then, and especially since everything is online, um, even more so, I mean, in the, in the frame of a pandemic. I'm wondering what your perspectives are, especially because you're an artist whose work deals with social activism. Do you have any perspective on the, um, the role or the issue of um, aesthetics or aestheticism in 
with regard to like social activism, especially because your art is activism, you know, so. Good question. Yeah. Good, very, very good question. Um, trying to think of an easy way to answer this. Um, the aesthetics, um, me as I'm coming from an artist perspective, me as an artist, um, usually I can just go off just creating content of whatever just happened. Um, with this one, it felt different and I didn't want to do anything because I felt like I already did it. So it's like either you heard a message before or you're going to hear the same message again and it might be new to you. Um, and with that, that's kind of how my perspective, how I took that. And I mean, honestly, with, with, with George Floyd, pretty much it, it was a straw that broke the camel's back. Like it, it literally just took off like fire. And, you know, me as a black male and where I come from, it was only a matter of time, to be honest with you, until the way it took off the way it did. Um, but with that said, the aesthetics of social media, some of I agree with, some of I don't, to be honest with you, just because a lot of people look at it from a commercial perspective, not necessarily from a um, uplifting perspective, I should say. So, and there's a fine line on that. And I think a lot of people really don't pay attention to that to that extent, but I do, because I am an artist and I like everything that I do to be authentic and never duplicate it unless it's telling a story. Um, but all in all, I still probably will do something that pertain to this moment in time, but it's kind of like I pretty much was just sitting back and just watching it all, even, even with January 6th, like, I'm not surprised that actually happened. I I I I just sit back and just like I I did gather that content the same way I did Supre. So in the future, maybe in this year, I will create something along the lines of that that probably will continue with that very last uh, slide I show you, the future of Supre, and include that in with that and continue that series that way. So that's how I kind of build off using social media and all the platforms, which really on going today, and then taking my work and look and see what I already have. And then building that extra little bit of detail so you can see that the story actually keeps going. So yeah, good good question. Very cool. Yeah, that sounds incredible. Um, and thank you for your perspective on that. Yeah. Okay. Lori, did did I get all the questions that were online? I'm getting a couple. Um, you got the questions, but I'm gonna read a couple comments okay. from Facebook that's, if that's, that's okay. That's fine. Um Trincia Waddell says, so awesome, Boyd. Congratulations. Who did? Um E. EMBK, I love that. Uh, Daryl Smith, thank you, Boyd. Great art and inspiration was a unique way to present these ideas. Um, Jolivet Anderson, I'm not sure that last name because it's smearing up. Um, kudos, Boyd. Uh, Joe Barry Carroll, congratulations. And um, just for what it's worth, we've got about 16 people watching on Facebook. Nice. Um, the other question that I got is, um, can we come see this exhibition? The answer is yes. Um, it's still on display at the Art Museum. And we do have, we're open four days a week with ticketed entrance. The tickets are free, um, but we are practicing COVID safety. So you can go to artlafayette.org and register for your free time slot to come and visit. Um, and we hope you do. Um, I also got a, call, a note from LaDonna, who works at the Art Museum and is there on the weekends. And she wanted me to share with you how awesome your exhibition is and how many people are moved and how they share with her how moved they are by what you've presented them with. So, Thank you. Awesome. What was the name of that first person you named? It was last um, name was Dale? Uh, now I gotta go find it again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, T-E-N-E-C-I-A Waddell. Waddell. Okay, I know who that is. Okay. Okay. Right. Awesome. Yeah. It's Great. I think I got everybody's couple people that sent me messages. Um, okay, I think. Oh, Sue, Sue Carr, Sue, Sue, tell Sue us at hi. I see, I see her message. Um, yeah, I think that's mainly it. Veronica. Veronica, hi. I thought I saw you earlier. If you're still on, tell hi. 
If not, oh, there you go. I see you. There you, there you. <laughs> Boy, I'm so proud of you. And I'm just so glad to be able to see that you're still doing great work. So just Appreciate keep it up, man. I just look forward to continue to see you do great things and to support you as well. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, my next goal is trying to figure out how I can tie in with the Olympics and Paralympics. I'm interested to see what that me being in that content and how my artwork possibly might be able to reflect off that too as well. So we'll, we'll see what we have here. Um, on top of that, like I'm here with, um, not here, but actually have work in a museum of uh, Leroy Neiman. So we have all of his pretty much Olympic um, drawings and paintings that he did during those times. So um, inspired by him as well too, and his perspective because we both use the same color palette, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, so using, or, or like basically, and instead of using, but studying like how he went about his role in Olympics and, and idolizing uh, Olympians during the games is making me take a different perspective on sports and how it's been looked at from a historical painting drawing role. So it's no different than Supre, but it basically just telling a different story uh, to basically the sports side of things. So I'm interested to see um, what I form um, in the future with that too. So it's, it'll be probably a pretty cool thing. Oh. Boy, um, this is Lori again. I love um, were you aware that painting was once an Olympic sport and yes. they gave medals? I, I, it, we exactly recently, right. we found a piece in our collection. Well, it's been there for a long time. I just discovered this. But we do have a piece in the museum collection from an Olympian, which is pretty cool. What was the name of that Olympian? Um, e oh, hard question. Um, it's a print. Okay. I'll have to, I'll put it in the notes when I remember it. <laughs> but it was pretty exciting. I was not aware that, that art was ever a part of the Olympics. So it, it was in the 30s, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, it was a real competition sport. People got medals from, and I think there's only one in history, which came in his name, who actually got a medal in art as well as competing in the sport um, mm. throughout Olympic history. And that was in the early, early 1900s. Just can't pinpoint the exact date just yet. But yes, I am very aware of that. Um, I'm actually trying to talk to the CEO and try to actually bring that back to the Olympics. If not, somehow how we can bring art uh, perspective into the Olympics and Paralympics because um, one thing about Paris 2024 is that they're bringing in break dancing. So I'm interested to see what that's going to be in as an Olympic sport as well, too. So things like that, I'm all for artistic roles and how they can play upon spark, uh, sports. Um, I talked to um, Al Arter's wife, Kathy Arter, um, yesterday, who um, husband Al Arter was an Olympian um, very well uh, for discus throwing. He creates artwork off throwing discs on canvases. So I thought that was so cool and how he inspired other athletes to do the same thing. So we have a long list of a lot of um, Olympians and Paralympians uh, and was well, really international club, but we have the ones here in the States that actually create artwork. And a lot of them I interviewed uh, or talked to Peter Sheffern. Peter Sheffern is a, um, a fencer in the 1980s. Um, he teaches art in California right now, but he did a sculpture for the museum. And um, the thing about it, what I told him, and he was very surprised, was that how sports and art are basically related. Um, they're like competition between the art artists and also like the athlete in their cells and how they push themselves. It's no different than how artists does too. So we was finding a lot of different types of way of how athletes and art are really the same. And since then, I've been trying to figure out like what does that look like in a in a competition. Um, so it's just a lot. Again, this is these are just ideas I've been introduced to within the last six months, trying to figure out how to get them conveyed to the to the viewers and, and the public and how uh, just a new take on how athletes and sports can fit inside of arts. Boyd, if, uh, if we could arrange a trip uh, with the Black Cultural Center and the Art Museum to come to Colorado Springs, could you lead us on a tour and tell us there's some things to do in that area? I sure could. I can do that. We also have special guests or special uh, team leaders who, who like that's their role. They'll Hello. tell you all these facts of little things uh, about I'm muted. and go from there. So, um, yeah, definitely can do that. We can figure that out for you. Boy, this is Kendall. I don't know if you heard me. I got an unstable connection, it says, but. Uh... 
Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. So I was saying if the, if uh, Renee and I plan a Black Cultural Center and an art museum combined trip to Colorado Springs, uh, we'd like yeah. to have you like put, you know, take us on a tour and tell us some things to do there. And, you know, we could really have a great time. And we'd like to love to visit your museum. Is it free? It's not free. Sorry. <laughs> It's not free, but we can we can accommodate group group, group packages. It's, it's okay. not a problem. Yeah. Like that. Um, but yeah, I'd be more than willing to help you all with that. Like I was saying, we we have team leaders who um, job description basically to tell the stories of all the artifacts in here, and they'll give you like the little hidden jewels that you didn't know about certain things in here. Uh, you might um, like uh, one of the team leaders showing me like one of the first um pilots of world war ii have to be one of the bobsledders of one of the games so things like that to that nature we'll be more than willing to tell you about but definitely worth the trip we can line that up for you that's not a problem you have my contact information so we can get that going and there's a lot of things out here for you to do um uh, but apparently we're, we're expecting two to five feet of snow so it won't be a good oh. time right now so <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually literally watching the range right now, just, just so make sure it don't start snowing on me while I'm on the phone with you all. But um, yeah, like we, we can definitely arrange that for you, Kendall. Should be a problem at all. Thank you. That that'd be so. That'd be very cool. Yeah. Thanks for your presentation tonight, Boyd. I know I kind of stumbled off the start, like every Zoom and Facebook Live thing does. Okay. It's hard to get everybody connected and all that, but you know, once you get going, with you you really made a wonderful presentation, and we sure appreciate having your your work in in Lafayette. Yep. I greatly appreciate it. I got a bad connection. Okay. Well, I don't think. Boyd? Yes. I'm just glad we're still here and it's you or the president. <laughs> art is winning out tonight. It is. <laughs> art, art always does its justice, dude. It does. Like, that's why I, I appreciate art so much. Yeah. I really do. And I'm humbled to even just be in a position to even do art. Um, seriously. Um, Cause I, I always hear like a lot of people like they, you know, they can't do art, but you really can. It's all about, you know, just getting that mindset together really for it. Um, but I am very humble to even have this opportunity to, to, to showcase some of the work. Um, it even, I even um, showed to the Pikes Peak um, culture board directors here. So that was pretty interesting talking to them and they found out through the Art Museum of Greater Lafayette. So I had to do a presentation with those board of directors, which came out very well as well too. So. Um, I'm again, I'm just very humbled to people actually want to hear the work um, that went into and what it's all about, though. So thank you, Sue. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you. You too. Always. I still have memories of us teaching that class over there, too. So Oakland High School, yeah. you bet. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Okay. Well, thank you, Boyd. Thanks for the wonderful presentation and and uh, bringing your work to back to our community and you know, at perfect time. And well, um, good to hear from you. And we hope to see you out in Colorado Springs. Yes, yes, you will see me here. They they don't want me to leave apparently, so I'm here for a while. So they don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Cool. <laughs> Appreciate it. I really appreciate it, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out <laughs> for time with me today. So, thanks so much, Boyd. And I'm going to put the plug in one more time. You can thanks everybody for for coming. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think we should thank everybody for coming, Lori. And thanks for <laughs> thanks for organizing it, Lori. And I think I think it worked out really well. Good night, everyone. Good night, and, and get your tickets at artlafayette.org. <laughs> Thanks so much, Boyd. All right, no problem.